Okay, good after, are we afternoon? Good morning, everybody. It is now 1130. So we'll go ahead and get started with our um, second in our autumn injury prevention series. Today, we are very fortunate to have um, two excellent speakers. We've got uh, Amanda Christensen and from Volunteers of America, and we've got Andrew Schnelby, from, uh, who is a nurse educator at the Trauma Burn ICU here at the University of Utah. Today, we're going to be talking about homelessness and how to keep the homeless population safe and prevent injuries, um, things that come up, and then find out resources that may be available as we get patients coming into our clinics and or the emergency department or anywhere within our system, um, how you can actually guide and help support this population. Um, so we do have no disclosures, um, neither the, the Jamie or Emily Johnson or our two speakers have any disclosures to um, disclose. Um, our next series, we have October 13th and we'll be focusing on hiking safety, followed up on October 27th with our backcountry safety series. And then on November, November 10th, we're gonna finalize our fall series with an injury AM suicide prevention program. So we hope that all of you can continue to join us on these bi-week, bi-monthly series that we have. Um, as usual, we will offer contact hours. We do offer contact hours for this series. And you just need to make sure that you complete the end of polling. Um, at the end of the series, we do have some pre-presentation questions that are going up now. Um, this is just to kind of get some idea of who's on our call and some information that you may know about the home, this presentation today. But in order to get the contact hours, please make sure that you let us know uh, who you are and answer the end of the session questions. And we will send the certificates out within a week. We are continuing our Intimate Partner Violence Primary Prevention Program. Um, that series has been going on since August and we are starting on October 6th. We have our next goal that we're focused on um, communicating and, and um, with with our, 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 our staff, I mean our community, and then Languages and Empowerment is our October series. We also are fortunate um, to work in collaboration with the Burn Unit at the University of Utah, and they have a crisis standard, crisis, crisis standards of care, um, and you can go ahead and go on to their crisis uh, standard of care website at the bottom of the screen, you can see that. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go back up. Um, and just introduce our guest speakers today. Um, I'm gonna let each of them introduce themselves. We're gonna start with Amanda Christensen, who is a social worker who works at the Volunteers of America. And um, then we've got Andrew Schnelby, who, who is a burn um, nurse educator in the ICU burn. So Amanda, if you'd like to introduce yourself, followed by Andrew, and then we'll get started with our, our presentation. Thank you. Um, my name is Amanda Christensen. I'm a licensed clinical social worker um, and I work for Volunteers of America, Utah. Um, I specifically am the director of um, VOA's Homeless Outreach Program. Um, so we work um, specifically with those who are unsheltered in Salt Lake County. Um, background, I've worked for Volunteers of America for about 10 years um, and mainly in homeless services as well as substance use. Um, programs here. Um, also spent some time working with um, youth specifically with the state of Utah and um, ended up coming back from the state to back to Volunteers of America um, to do our work here with the homeless population. Uh, so that's my story. Awesome. Thank you. And go ahead if um, Drew if you want to introduce yourself out and then we'll get let Amanda go forward with her presentation. Sure. Uh, my name is Drew Schnibley. Um I am currently the um, nurse educator for the Burn Trauma and Burn Center um, here at the University of Utah. A uh, little background, I've been a registered nurse here with the university for about four years and then kind of just some sporadic uh, background but everywhere from uh, EMS to other nursing jobs. Um, I have been a volunteer with uh, 4th Street and with some other homeless programs here in the Valley. Um, but yeah, currently just an educator here on the Burn Unit. Great. Thank you. 
So just to let everyone know, if you have a question, just go ahead and put it in the chat or unmute yourself and feel free to pop in. Um, and then we'll just be following the chat and make sure that there's an appropriate time. So Amanda, thank you, go ahead. Thanks, um, thanks for having me. I'm excited to kind of talk about what we see um, as far as um, in the populations that we serve in Salt Lake County. Um, so like I said, we, we specifically work with those in Salt Lake County and I have specific programming that is, um, works in Salt Lake City proper as well. Um, so our, our agency serves anyone who's experiencing unsheltered homelessness, my specific program does. Um, Volunteers of America um, also has multiple programs ranging from substance use detox to um, mental health treatment um, uh, and as well as um, youth specific homelessness with our youth resource center. Um, we kind of run the gamut on um, providing services for those who are um, currently homeless as well as um, to treat substance use disorder and mental health um, issues. We also most recently uh, are the operator of the the Geraldine E. King Women's Resource Center. So that is one of the new resource centers in Salt Lake City um, for women experiencing homelessness. Um, so I'm just going to get started and talk a little bit about kind of what homelessness looks like um, because it can take a couple different shapes. Um, and so as far as what we typically see um, and what we're looking for is really anyone staying in a place not meant for human habitation. So I think that for some, um, you may say, okay, someone's staying in an RV or something like that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're homeless, but it can if the RV does not have running water, um, you know, um, toilet options or doesn't have heat, um, then it's really not meant for habitation. So we would even consider that um, homeless. Um, so a couple different things. Um, we see on, on unsheltered homeless outreach, um, people in encampments, which I think is what you typically think of when you think of someone that is homeless, um, potentially either in shelter or sleeping on the streets in an, in an actual like camp type site. Um, we see encampments, but we also see things like um, just people with a bedroll, um, people that just have kind of their belongings with them that are moving about that don't have a stationary place like a campsite. Um, we also see individuals staying in vehicles. Um, this has increased since COVID began. Um, we have seen an increase in car camping. Um, and most typically um, with car camping, um, frequently that's individuals who are new to homelessness um, and you know, still have access to a vehicle. Or we do see when families enter homelessness sometimes, um, they will tend to stay in their vehicle first. Um, before accessing services. Um, so vehicle camping, we also um, see individuals staying in buildings or structures, so um, abandoned buildings accessing those type of spaces, um, as well as um, we have kind of a, a number of individuals who tend to, at least in the nighttime, um, access 24-hour facilities. So. Um, this may be someone just sitting in Denny's and ordering a cup of coffee and staying up all night, just sitting in Denny's um, to stay warm, potentially um, to have the safety around being in that space. Um, or it may, may be um, accessing 24 hour businesses like um, hanging out at the airport's um, luggage collection area. Um, pop up against a wall, hanging out there, um, potentially sleeping there overnight um, indoors. Um, so we also see individuals staying in motels. Uh, this, I would say more frequently is those who have some sort of income. So those who get maybe SSDI um, at, you know, at the beginning of the month, they may get a hotel room for, for a little while while they can pay for it. Um, and then you'll find them um, kind of switching between whether it's staying in shelter or unsheltered um, after that. And also couch surfing or moving between friends home. This is also really common amongst youth and families is um, kind of doing a mix where they stay on stay at people's homes while they can, um, but are kind of bouncing between spaces 
places and then maybe staying in shelter on occasion and or in their vehicle on occasion. Um, so there's a good mix of kind of all of these things happening and, and, and that's essentially I mean, what, what we see as far as homelessness. Um, rural communities tend to be a little bit different. We specifically serve Salt Lake County, but in rural communities, um, what we notice most is there's less resources, right, in a rural community. Um, so people tend to, um, it takes a little bit longer for people to get assistance um, just simply due to the lack of resources. There's also less prevention services in rural communities simply because there is lack of resources. Um, it's also usually transportation heavy. So because things are fairly spread out, you find people having to travel for resources um, and or rely on kind of phone or technology to access resources um, because you know they're not near or close to some of these services. Um, you're still going to find some of the same traditional camping situations that I listed. Um, camping, staying in cars, accessing motels when they're able to. Um, you may also find in rural communities where, where um, you know, there's a smaller number of people and less resources that um, kind of assistance and um, the awareness that someone's struggling typically comes through some community type entity, whether it's the schools, churches, um, you know, hanging out in libraries, um, things like that. And obviously with lack of income and, um, you know, being more rural, you, you may run into issues of digital um, inequality, which really impacts the ability to access services. Um, especially with COVID being um, an issue, a lot of services have moved to phone or online and less in-person options. And so this is something that we're looking at as a system really as a whole right now. Um, essentially what we see in regards to medical concerns, because that's your guys' area, um, I would say the kind of number of issues, um, there's a large range, but um, the top four issues that we're seeing medically on the streets um, is really things like wound care issues. So uh, abscesses, falls, cuts, or other injuries that really haven't been treated and due to hygiene issues um, and not being treated um, tend to worsen. Um, we untreated diabetes and untreated hypertension are huge issues that we run into um, on the streets as well as upper respiratory stuff. Um, those are probably some of our most common alongside untreated mental illness. Uh, so mental health issues as well as substance use um, issues. So those are, are some of our, our most common issues that we're seeing um, on the streets, but we also see um, different issues depending on the time of the year, right? So in summertime, dehydration is a huge problem, like severe sunburning, um, bug bites, um, things like that we run into during um, summertime, during wintertime, you have your issues um, with cold exposure. So, um, you know, really trying to educate individuals around um, what that looks like, um, if they start seeing it, you know, how to seek help for it, as well as trying to get them access to, to warm weather items to try to keep um, cold exposure from, from impacting them. Um, we also see a number of issues um, due to just lack of hygiene, right? So um, because individuals may not have access to appropriate hygiene supplies or access to showers or facilities, um, that becomes um, an issue, especially if it's prolonged or over, or over long periods of time. Um, additionally, I think that it's, I mean, you guys already know this, but complication, I mean, we have more complications um, when these, these issues are untreated. Um, so it, what ends up happening is typically we, we end up locating someone and it's been quite some time and, and they have gone untreated. And so it really complicates it and results in kind of a higher level of care needed um, in order to treat it. Um, additionally, we, on, on, a, on a different note, we 
see and have had issues with TBIs specifically because um, either they haven't been treated or they're not documented. And so when it comes to the service side, it's really hard to kind of prove that it's a TBI or that that may be the issue. Um, and so um, it really becomes a barrier to treatment and a barrier to services. Um, so wanted to kind of plug that because that's something that we see and that we run into um, with individuals who have reported TBIs, um, but when we're trying to get them specific services, um, we weren't able to find documentation or things um, stating that. So. Sorry, regarding that, um, the uh, TBI, uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean. I know what a TBI is, um, but how is it that it's not recorded or I, I just under, don't understand how that is preventing services, not having that uh, documented? Yeah, so um, if the individual say it was years ago and they say they've had it and they don't, there's, we're unable to access paperwork, so either you know, maybe they were treated at like a family clinic or a hospital and they don't have any background paperwork that they went in for like a head injury. Um, and really what happens is a lot of times individuals could potentially get social security disability or other services based off the TBI um, because it has changed um, functioning. Um, and if we don't have documentation to basically say this was when the incident happened, this is how it was treated, this is kind of the results of it, um, then they, they can't have access to that. Okay, as, as, as documentation for a disability right. to get access to government resources. Yes, to government uh, resources, yeah. Thanks. Uh -huh. um, any other, I mean, I guess I'll just move on to kind of suggestions for medical staff. Um, when homeless patients kind of show up at the ED or you run into them in your clinics or things like that, I mean, obviously we want to treat them with respect like anyone else. Um, but on top of that, if you know someone is kind of struggling in general, um, we really look at it from kind of a trauma informed perspective because majority of our clients have experienced some sort of trauma. And so understanding that um, their behaviors, um, are likely going to be impacted by that trauma. Um, and so what we do on our end is really try to, whenever possible, allow the client, you know, as much autonomy as, as we can by kind of asking, asking permission questions, essentially. So letting them kind of direct um, uh, their care a little bit. I know that's obviously gonna be different in the medical field, but simply asking like, hey, is it okay if I sit over here? Um, are you comfortable with that? Things like that, because um, clients can potentially have trauma triggers and things like that. So that's what we do. And I'm sure you all probably are considering trauma um, when, you're, when you're interacting with individuals who um, are really struggling in general. But, um, and just understanding that these individuals may not have access to some of the basic things that others do. Um, whether that's, um, we find a lot like wound care stuff. So it'll be like their, their wound, they may have some wound care, some treatment done, and then they're released. And then they don't have a way to continuously um, redress the wound because they don't have the supplies to do so or access to the supplies to do so. So, and I don't know if you guys have the capability to send them with stuff when they leave or, or what the situation may be, but considering some of that stuff, um, what their access may be um, and what, what their um, skills may be as far as navigating some of that. A lot of the individuals who we run into um, may struggle with navigating the medical system and just not have the knowledge um, in order to navigate. So they may need, you know, like a patient navigator or something like that to help them to understand either kind of what's happening, what the next steps are, potentially help them make some phone calls or some follow-up care calls, things like that. Um, because it can be kind of overwhelming um, when, you know, uh, entering the medical system and not really understanding or knowing how it works, but also um, not really having the means whether that's the cognitive functioning or um, you know, being sober enough or whatever it might be to um, take whatever instruction you're giving and actually follow up on that instruction. So um, 
It may be helping them to set up follow-up appointments, if that's the case, sending them with written instructions, um, really um, spending maybe a little bit of additional time on helping to understand what um, their needs are and um, how best to move forward with um, assisting them with their medical condition. Um, a piece of that also may be is when you are referring out, um, transportation can be a barrier for clients. And so if they're expected to come back in for additional appointments um, and you're referring them to another clinic, looking at and, and talking them through what might be the best option for them, um, depending on where they are staying in the community. Because the, close, the closer you can get them to wherever um, that medical treatment area or site is, the better, um, because transportation is a struggle. Um, additionally, with this population, it may be a little bit more difficult to get a history or kind of like knowledge of the patient or the patient um, really getting kind of, you know, extended good care from like a primary provider, as some clients don't have primary providers and they may jump around from different EDs or different hospitals, depending on what area they're in or if depending on where they're sent, if it's a medical emergency or things like that. Um, and so that can be difficult, kind of a barrier for clients um, and a barrier for medical providers, right? Um, when you can't get a real good picture on what's going on with the individual um, and what their needs are. Um, and Amanda, then, Amanda, there's a question that says um, from John Clark, it says, do you still have the van to assist in transportation in the community? So we still have the outreach team running. We're not specifically transportation. Um, so there are times where we can help clients get to a, appointments um, if it's, you know, emergent. And we also, depending on the situation, could, could access other transportation means like a bus, a bus token. Um, but that is not like the sole role of that team is to transport because we could spend all day transporting and never actually engage a client um, because the need is so great. So really it's if it's a client that we're working with and that it's something that's very specific, we can help with that. Additionally, if they are actually staying in any of the resource centers, there's potential that the resource center could help with transportation as well on helping them either get a bus pass to get back and forth to their appointments or um, potentially taking them to their appointments. So to kind of look at it as a, on a case by case basis, John. Um, but yes, the transportation can be can be a struggle, um, and we recognize that. Um, um, the other thing to just think about, and I know that U of U has a program, um, but when individuals are coming in, um, specifically um, those that are using opiates, um, looking at at MAT options um, with them, I think that more people than more people would be interested in medical assisted treatment options um, if they're made available. And so um, knowing your kind of capacity and how you guys do that um, would be helpful. Um, being creative in treatment. I mean, I recently heard uh, that there is, you know, a, a provider that is at your guys' new sugar house clinic who's actually going out to the street and treating one of our individuals. Um, and I don't know, obviously that's gonna depend on capacity and what, what you all have going on, but um, really being creative and thinking about how to treat these clients where they are and or, um, you know, we, we do have medical outreach that goes out with us once a week that's a combined effort with Four Street Clinic um, where we have a doctor that goes out for about four hours every week and really looks at some of these issues, some of these wound care stuff, some of these issues that we're seeing. Um, but medical outreach efforts um, tend to go fairly well because the clients aren't having to go into a clinic and or they're able to build rapport with the provider prior to going into a clinic because a lot of our clients have experienced bias and or felt that they've been treated unfairly in some way um, or are just simply uncomfortable accessing traditional medical care. Um, and so and part of that is their trauma and just, you know, past experiences that they've had. And so they may be reluctant to access traditional medical services or to attend appointments or 
or things like that. And so um, being able to uh, meet them where they are, to build that rapport really helps to bring them in clinic um, and um, get a good idea of, of what's going on and treat them um, longer term. Um, another thing is, is um, just knowing and kind of being thoughtful about prevention. I think that prevention with this population can be fairly difficult. A lot of times what ends up happening is it's a critical issue, right? And they end up in the ED because it's now an emergency. Um, or, um, and so we're missing kind of the opportunity to do like preventative medical care um, if they're not accessing, accessing regular, you know, primary providers or maybe they don't have benefits um, currently. So, um, yeah, that's um, kind of advice to you. As far as other services, I mean, you're probably are already aware, at least in Salt Lake City, we use a lot and partner a lot with Four Street Clinic, Sacred Circle, Malahi, any of those type of kind of low income clinics. Um, I would say our number one partner is probably Four Street Clinic because we do do joint outreach efforts with them um, and no benefits are required um, for their services. So, um, they're a large partner of ours um, and um, as well as um, we do refer people over to Sacred Circle fairly frequently. Um, what is as far as our role, um, you know, and how we can collaborate. Um, I've talked a little bit about what we do and I'll go into a little bit more depth about that. So um, we specifically serve those who are unsheltered in Salt Lake County. Um, what we do is we um, go out into the community and find where folks are. Um, at that point, we start to engage and, and really build rapport with these individuals. Um, a lot of individuals who we find are unsheltered, typically for a reason. Um, there's a couple different. One, maybe they don't feel safe or comfortable or have had, you know, past experiences in traditional shelter or homeless options. Um, anxiety, mental illness, substance use, all of those things can kind of prevent people um, from going into shelter. Um, and so, and then the other issue that we're experiencing in Salt Lake County right now is a capacity issue. Our shelters are typically at capacity. And so we have a number of folks that are unsheltered because there isn't an option um, currently. So we're, we kind of run into both of those issues. Um, so we really try to build rapport, get people into the services that are available and being creative in doing that. Um, you know, new options are kind of coming online. And as we have kind of winter overflow shelters op, um, opening, we have um, the uh, uh, Stay Safe, Stay Home Hotel right now that's operating, um, which is for those who are vo more vulnerable to COVID-19, it's an option for them. Um, and so we're constantly kind of learning about and engaging with other community providers on where we can get folks, where's the best placement. Um, and a big piece of that is us having rapport with the client up front to get them to go there. Um, and obviously there's a portion that are just going to remain kind of on the streets and maybe isolated from others and things like that. And for those individuals, it's engaging in other conversations, potentially around housing, um, around um, needed items, especially when the weather gets hot and cold and we're trying to combat some of those um, weather related medical problems um, and, you know, just giving out some basic needs items. We do have, you know, clothing and shoes and those type of things and we do give them out um, to clients as needed. Um, and we really do that as a means to connect with the client. So um, this is a thing that we can do for them to, to help build rapport so that we can ideally get them to a place where they're, um, you know, more stable, they're safe, they're sheltered, um, they're, you know, accessing services so that they can um, move out of homelessness. Um, so as far as we go, we work with both individuals and we have worked with families. We tend to see a lot more families with our library outreach team. So we have a team that specifically works out of the Salt Lake City library system. And like I kind of said earlier, families traditionally access services a little bit differently. They may start staying out of a vehicle or hopping from family or friend's house. And they also tend to access libraries because it's a space where their children can be. So um, we do have a lot of engagement um, in the library system as well. Um, so if you are noticing clients and or individuals who you know are, um, you know, sheltered or unsheltered, if they are sheltered, 
a piece of that maybe seeing if they have case management in their shelter and then connecting with that case management um, in order to kind of help coordinate services or care for the client. Um, if it's an individual who is unsheltered, um, I'll put our phone number and their information up. You can either have the client um, let us know or give us a call. You can give us a call on the client's behalf. Or if you know or just see as you're out in the community um, areas that may need outreach services, you would just, um, you can also just give us a call and just say, hey, I noticed some folks in this area um, who may be in need of services or hey, I've, you know, potentially had a patient or know of someone staying in a certain area and we will just go out and check out that area um, and see if anyone's in need of any services um, or we can connect them um, to shelter or any other options that are available. Um, uh, yeah, accessing our website is gonna be your best kind of place to figure, to, to look at kind of all VOA services. Um, like I said, we do have mental health services. Um, we have detox services um, as well as um, youth specific services. Um, and I'm just gonna throw that in the chat. Is there any other questions or anything else that I can answer for you? Yeah, Amanda, I have one question. Oh, go ahead, please go. Oh, Amanda, I was just going to ask, um, when, if, if EMS picks up a homeless patient in, in, out in the field and they've cleared them medically, would it be appropriate for them to take, bring them to you? Or is it more appropriate for them to go to an emergency room first? So if they're in need of anything medical, then it probably would be take them to an ED. So, um, cause we don't, I mean, we don't treat medical stuff. Um, if it's a situation where um, they may be in need of something, like say you notice they don't have shoes or there's, you know, they may need assistance with other supplies or help referring them to a resource center, then they can most definitely give us a call and just let us know where that individual's at and we can try to get to that individual, um, you know, when, as soon as, as soon as we're essentially able to. Um, we do coordinate and, and do work with kind of community fire um, uh, individuals as well as Salt Lake City PD fairly regularly. So, um, you know, there, there is kind of some coordination on that end. But yeah, if they're in need of anything medical, I would say they need to go to the ER. And then if it's something that's more kind of service-based or um, needs like items, then they can give us a call. So Amanda, I had a question or kind of two prong. When you're talking about the addiction component and then you're talking about the mental health component, which oftentimes they're overlapping, mm -hmm. obviously the trauma uh, experiences, um, do you have services on site or do you refer to either like for mental health illness uh, treatment, you go to Fourth Street Clinic, is there, do you have services where people can get some types of, some type of treatments or within your capacity of uh, Volunteers of America? Or how do you, how do you refer to both of those different avenues? So um, if it's like an emergent, like someone's having a psychotic break, we're using any resource like potentially calling 911, depending on the situation or using uni crisis line or, or those type of resources, just like everybody else. Right. Um, if it's a client who we tend to be working with or say you're working with a client and you want to refer them to a mental health provider, we do have, it's called Cornerstone Counseling Center. Um, and that is a counseling center where um, they can go have, go through the admissions process, um, you know, getting a mental health assessment essentially um, to decide whether or not, um, you know, the level of mental health treatment is appropriate for cornerstone counseling. Um, and they both do substance use counseling and just mental health counseling as well as like uh, domestic violence. I think they have a specific domestic violence program there um, and they have youth specific as well. Um, so Cornerstone Counseling Center is one that you could potentially call and refer a client to for mental health, for ongoing mental health services. It's not residential, so they have day treatment programs. Um, and so it wouldn't look like, um, you know, a residential treatment program. Excellent. Any other questions? You can either pop on or you can put it in the chat. Excellent. Amanda, thank you so much for presenting to all of us. It was very helpful and informative. And I know that you're sending us a brochure of um, Volunteers of America and our team will make sure we get out um, that information to everybody who's participating. Awesome, so, thank you so much. Uh, 
Take care. Thank you. And then Drew, whenever you're ready. All right. Um, thank you, Amanda. I actually took some good notes that I'm going to be passing on to our team and to our providers and our case managers. So uh, that was actually, that was great. Um, kind of a little more background on me. Like I said, my name is Drew. I'm the um, burn unit educator. Um, our, I've been asked uh, to kind of speak more specifically on um, hot and heat and cold related injuries and uh, some other things like that. Um, our burn center, we specifically deal more with the soft tissue injuries, kind of how um, what Amanda talked about, some of those, the wound care, um, those uh, wounds that get infected, things like that. So we'll, we actually do see quite a few of those, um, those wounds uh, throughout the year. Um, and then, you know, the, the heat and cold related injuries. Um, you know, we generally see the, the ones that uh, become more life threatening. Um, but um, uh, we'll just start off uh, kind of talking about um, the acute phase, kind of the EMS phase. Um, for my EMS guys out there, um, if you come upon somebody, you know, who's out in the field, um, who has a wound, who um, is, you know, sick, who has some of these issues, um, you know, if they have a burn or if they have frostbite, depending on the time of year, um, you know, best thing you can do is either, whether it's a heat, a heat injury, whether it's a cold injury, um, if they have some kind of wound, one of the easiest and best things you can do is to actually uh, keep them from getting hypothermic, keep them from getting cold, or keep them from getting heat stroke if it's in the middle of the summer. So uh, thermal regulation is going to be very, very critical to stabilizing uh, any patients with, um, with heat injuries, with cold injuries. Um, you know, just making sure that they are, are not too hot or cold. Um, uh, let's, let's just kind of categorize these. Let's talk uh, more about our heat injuries. Um, some of the more common heat injuries that we see um, during the summer, we see a lot of asphalt burns. Um, some of these guys, you know, they fall asleep or they pass out, whether it's from malnutrition or from substance use, and they will actually fall asleep on pavement or on sidewalks and they will lay there and they will actually develop some pretty nasty burns. So uh, whether you're EMS or whether you're in the ER, um, you know, wherever you happen to be at, um, you know, best thing you can do, again, keep them warm, uh, keep the wound clean and dry, uh, wrap it in just a very dry dressing, something very, very simple. Um, and then um, EMS, if you guys ever have any questions, if your medical directors have questions, um, they are welcome to call our transfer center or call our burn unit directly. Um, I, I'll throw up our number here um, at the end. Uh, and then, you know, just make sure that they are, you know, getting appropriate care medically. Um, one of the biggest things, whether it's a heat or cold injury, uh, is also dehydration, making sure that they are properly hydrated. If they are safe to take in PO fluids, that is probably the best way to rehydrate. Um, if it's a larger injury, uh, IV rehydration is recommended. Um, and, you know, we have protocols that we can help you with. Um, if, you're, if you already have protocols on the ambulances or in your own ERs, you know, go ahead and follow those. But again, if you ever have any questions regarding those, uh, feel free to reach out to us at the burn center. Um, other potential heat injuries that we see are uh, from burn barrels in the winter. So kind of coming up here into our colder times, we see uh, campfires, we see a lot of uh, burn barrels. Um, kind of something that Amanda touched on is when, uh, a lot of families will actually be living in trailers or in vehicles or in these confined spaces and they will actually bring in space heaters or they will bring in propane heaters and they will either sleep too close or we will see those explode. So we will actually be seeing an uptick um, in uh, heat injuries during the winter months. And some of, like, some of the most dangerous times is when we get these heat injuries and it's cold outside, they will quickly become hypothermic. Uh, you know, if you come upon one of these, uh, you know, unsheltered uh, individuals or families, one of the first things you can do is to check their temperature. However, you know, you can do that, make sure that they are not severely hypothermic. And if they are, uh, do consider rapid rewarming, you know, blankets, warm IV fluid, whatever you can do to get them warm. 
uh, is just absolutely critical, critical and vital to their survival. Um, other things, um, you know, just um, exposure, sunburn, uh, they can quickly develop heat stroke, quickly develop uh, heat exhaustion. Um, and again, um, just getting them out of that source and getting them, you know, maybe out, out of the sun, uh, evaluating them if they need to be taken to the ER, if they need to be brought here to the burn center, that is always a, a conversation that can be had later, but just get them away from the source of injury. Um, uh, we, moving on to uh, cold injuries, we're coming up into the cold season. Uh, we're going to start seeing a lot of exposure injuries. Um, you know, the winds pick up here, uh, just wind burn, uh, frostbite is a really, really big one that we will start seeing, particularly among our unsheltered population. Um, some of the things that you can do if you happen to see these things, you know, whether it's just from extreme exposure or if they do have frostbite, um, again, check for hypothermia, rapid rewarming. Um, if you do identify uh, severe frostbite, um, we do want that extremity or that limb or that area, you know, unfrozen and rewarmed, but only if you can guarantee that it will not be re-injured from the cold. So uh, particularly for my EMS guys out there, uh, if you come upon somebody in the field, they've got frostbite, um, and you know, you get them in the back of the ambulance, you, brought, you want to rewarm it, but maybe they are going to have a prolonged uh, transport, you know, they might be re-exposed to the cold. Uh, actually do not rewarm that site, just wrap it in a dressing and get them to the nearest emergency room where they can rewarm it there. Um, one of the worst things that we can do for a frostbite injury is to rewarm it and then have it refreeze. Um, uh, for um, you know any any cold exposure, really any wound injury, any whether it's a burn, whether it's uh, whether it's frostbite, anything um, anything wet is going to make it worse. So make sure that they are dry. If they're in any amount of dry clothing, get rid of it. Um, particularly among our unsheltered population, uh, this can make them a little upset. So just kind of be prepared for that. Be prepared to educate them why you are discarding or at least removing their wet clothing. Um, if it's possible to remove this clothing without those shears. Um, coming from an EMS background, I, I know we love to just cut those things off, but particularly among these guys, if it's possible to spend a little extra time to take off their, their wet clothing, you know, do that. Uh, they will generally appreciate you a little bit more. Um, just one of those little things to consider and think about with these guys. Um, other issues uh, that are not necessarily heat or cold, but some of those chronic wounds that you might see, um, again, just keep it clean, uh, wrap it in, in a dry dressing. Um, if you're EMS, get them to the nearest emergency department. Um, if you are working in a facility, um, putting them in something clean, something simple, uh, cleaning the wound, particularly if it doesn't, if this isn't a wound that's bad enough that necessarily warrants admission, uh, but that does need treatment, um, putting in a, um, in a clean dressing, getting the wound uh, as clean as you can, and then considering simple dressings. Uh, so kind of how Amanda touched on earlier that they don't have a lot of resources, they don't have a lot of access to care. So uh, consider dressings that are very, very simple, very, very, very um, easy to carry around. So simple gauze, uh, simple ace bandages and, and small, um, you know, get, uh, give them as much supplies as you can reasonably afford to give them as they can reasonably carry because more than likely they are not going to have great access to wound care. Um, and so just being able to keep it simple and keep it small and then provide them with whatever we can um, is will go a long way to helping them out. Um, other things uh, kind of to consider are, you know, some of those gaps, you know, between hospital and discharge, um, you know, so maybe that might, you know, bring that up with your providers. Hey, maybe we need to watch these guys overnight. I know normal, if this were a normal person, we could just send them out, but because of the nature of their psychosocial 
aspects, we may want to watch them overnight to make sure that this doesn't go south and that they don't end up developing more problems and just coming, you know, right, you know, right back in for EMS to our ER, you know, the next day or two. Um, so maybe watching them overnight, you know, might uh, be beneficial, whereas in a more normal situation, you would actually send them out. I think that is actually all I have as far as my notes. Does anybody have any questions uh, specifically regarding cold injury or heat injury or, you know, chronic wounds um, in general or as they relate to our unsheltered population? How often do you see people actually admitted and on your watch when you're, you know, on your unit? Uh, on my unit in particular, um, if they make it to us, they're going to be admitted. Um, mm -hmm. If it's bad enough that we're getting a phone call from, you know, South Jordan ER or from any, I mean, our, our burn center, we actually cover eight different states um, everywhere, you know, from the northern border of Idaho over to Oregon, down to Arizona and out to Colorado. I mean, we cover a very wide area. So if we're getting a phone call, more than likely, we will be admitting them. Um, I do, uh, you know, I have taken several phone calls where we just end up, um, you know, acquiring photographs or kind of maybe working with the team because, yeah, this isn't great, but they don't need to be transferred to the university, um, you know, but we will kind of help direct some care and help direct uh, where those cares need to go and how they can be managed. And also you said you had some experience working at the 4th Street Clinic. What did that look like for you and you know what types of prevention, I mean it's hard to do the prevention, I think a lot of it is the outreach, but yeah. um, maybe in just communicating with uh, homeless population and trying to make sure that they get into the resources that that they that will be helpful to them. Uh, so Volunteering at 4th Street, um, it's, it's actually very, very difficult. Um, resources are extremely limited. Um, and so that's why we actually relied very heavily kind of upon, you know, some of our community uh, hospitals and some of our, our clinics, um, you know, for some of the more advanced cares. I mean, it, they can do very, very basic things over at 4th Street. You know, um, they may not have supplies that week. They may have some simple supplies. Um, but they, you know, Forest Street cannot be relied upon 100% to take care of some of these more serious wounds, some of these, you know, more serious burns and frostbites. Um, like I said, if it's simple, if it's small, you know, they can be contacted and, you know, simple dressing changes. Um, so maybe um, referring that, you know, if you have a dressing that may, they may need help changing, you can contact 4th Street. The other issue with 4th Street is they are just so overwhelmed and so swamped that sometimes they just don't have the ability or manpower to get to everyone that needs help. So providing education um, while you have them in your service, while you have them there, you know, giving them education on how to keep the wound clean, even if it's just washing it with soap and water. You know, maybe they you know, we'll end up in a, in a restroom somewhere where there's soap and water, maybe just taking the extra time to wash their hands and then wash that, you know, take another minute or two to wash that wound and redress it. I mean, that could go a long way to helping that wound heal. But um, yeah, Fourth Street Clinic is quite frequently overwhelmed with uh, the amount of people that they're inundated with. So yeah. Uh, one other thing that I will mention, um, if uh, you ever do have a question, um, if, you know, maybe you're looking at a wound, or you're looking at a frostbite, or you're looking at a burn, and you're going, is this something that we need help with? Can we manage this? Um, there actually is an app that you can download on your phone. It's U of U Burn Med Pick. You can download it. You can actually send us pictures. If you upload a picture to that with your smartphone, it actually goes right to one of our APCs and our burn charge nurse, and they can review that and give you a call back within 30 minutes and just provide you with that help and information. Drew, could you write that in the chat, please? I absolutely will. I'm doing that as we speak. Great, thank you. Excellent. Are there any other um, questions or thoughts or information that you would like to share with this community? Um, please let us know. Thank you. It says U of U Burn Med Pick and the Burn Center number 
is 801-581-2700. Linda, I am gonna throw out too, for those of you that are still logged on, we do have our uh, EMS trauma ground rounds on October 14th, uh, talking about uh, toxicology uh, meds right now that are popular and overdosing and things like that. So I'm sure that with your friends, we'll be sending out communication. And then thank you again, Drew. Uh, Drew and Amanda both came through for us kind of last minute uh, and put this together. So we really appreciate your guys' time and, and your quick response for helping us out with that. Jamie, what time is the drama grand round? Uh, it's from two to three. And yeah. again, I will be sending out uh, next week, I'll be sending out a flyer and then we'll get a day before a reminder as well with all the login information. Excellent. If you wanna um, put up the second poll, that would be great. And then um, if anybody has any questions, you can put them in the chat or let us know. Um, remember our next, uh, our next session is on October, I think we said 13th. Um, and it's going to be on hiking safety. So really how to, how to handle um, and educate our clients and our patients when they come in on when they're out in the wilderness, how do you stay safe? What types of precautions can you use, particularly at the, this time of year when the weather can change very, very quickly. We wanna make sure that people are staying safe. Um, and that's going to be our next session. So we really look forward to everyone joining in on that as well. So remember, if you'd like to get your, any kind of participation certificate and or nursing certificate uh, for contact hours, make sure you finish this poll and you will receive your certificate within the next week. If anybody has questions, you can reach out to Jamie. If you wanna put your email in there. Um, or myself, or Emily, and uh, we can make sure. Also, if you have any topics that you're interested in hearing about as we plan our next endeavor for winter safety uh, or something in the spring that really you feel like you'd like to get some expertise, um, knowledge on that, please let us know. I'll put my email in here as well. Yes, and our winter safety is going to start in January, so starting our planning now, even though October is just tomorrow around the corner. <laughs> it's great to get on it. So again, thank everyone for participating. We've got about 14 of the 18 of you who have completed the survey. And uh, so those of you will stay on for another probably two minutes. Uh, Drew, any parting words or comments you'd like to share with us? Thank you for jumping on at such last minute. Um, nothing really. Thanks for having me, you guys. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, we appreciate all the expertise from University of Utah and as well as the community. It seems like when we pair everybody together, we get a lot of great information and resources. So we will be sending out the brochure from the Volunteers of America to each of you who are participating and we'll make sure that um, that information gets out to you and any other information recommendations that we receive, we will pass it along to you all. Okay, we have about one more minute to complete that poll. We actually ended early today. We're doing, we're getting better. Yay, I know. <laughs> You can get your last minute of lunch or sit back and listen to a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and thank you guys again for everybody that's joining in. Speaking of podcasts, uh, Emily and I are going to do start a collaborative podcast with our uh, other trauma centers with IMC and with St. Mark's. Um, we're working on maybe starting that first of November and doing it every other month. Um, we keep forgetting because we haven't really finalized it yet, uh, but it will be geared towards our outdoor enthusiasts. Um, what's our, what's the name again, Emily? We're probably going with, she's going to chat it. <laughs> she said adventures and injury prevention, safely exploring Utah's great outdoors. Yes. That sounds amazing. So hopefully, uh, yeah, everybody that's kind of hanging on waiting to finish up this poll or for us to be done, then, um, we'll, we'll do an intro to our, just ourselves starting off with the first one and then um be in january again talk all about injury prevention so oh, i can't wait I guess you don't need to be on camera for that one okay we are at 12 26 we're going to go ahead and end the polling and we're going to let you all go home a little bit early and uh get back to work or whatever you're going to do thanks for joining <laughs>